I wasn't feeling good. All right, we are live. How's everybody doing? Uh, to kick us off, I thought about it, and what I didn't get covered yesterday, uh, I figured a way. Uh, if you notice, this is titled specifically for um, a operations, and that's because we are going to go over that. We're going to hit uh, loading control and basically everything that I didn't get to uh, also applies to the operations side. So I can cover all those same topics. And I don't really miss out on anything uh, while still kind of keeping our training uh, programming segments moving along. Yesterday, uh, while it was a very just rushed kind of blow through uh, of the core mechanical side of the system, uh, it should have given you a fairly decent scope of just kind of what things are, some different terminology. There's a lot more to talk about than what we did talk about, but you've got a really solid starting point. Moving on from there. So uh, when we're talking chillers, you know, the, the basic definition of a chiller is something that is, is cooling water. Now, that's where we have two different sides of the industry. We have air-cooled and water-cooled chillers. Uh, we're specifically honing in on water-cooled. We did air-cooled last month. But uh, in this case, in, when we say it's a water-cooled, we, we're, we're, we're referring to the condenser. So the condenser and the evaporator, you work in unison just like any system would. And ultimately, the vast majority of comfort cooling, and I'm going to speak solely towards a comfort cooling scenario in this class. I'm not going to go into some of the more industrial side where uh, we start dealing with uh, uh, like ice, uh, ice buildup or storage tanks or thermal storage or anything of that nature. That's deeper than this class is intended for. But we will talk about some of the basic staging and how that's going to work. Ultimately, 45 degrees is a very general, and everything's going to be in Fahrenheit, is a very general uh, set point that we are typically trying to achieve. Now, there's a wide range of set points that actually uh, sort around this. So in reality, uh, we have a lot of buildings that go from anywhere from 42 to 48. And it heavily depends on the time of year that we're trying to achieve this. Usually, in the hotter summer months, or especially during the more humid time, we're shooting more for the 42 because we're going to get a lot more dehumidification at that point. Uh, and, and there's a lot of buildings, and I'm seeing this more and more. I'm not exactly sure why, to be honest, but it is, for, for whatever reason, a lot of the engineering firms are specking 42 degree systems more than I've seen them do in the past. Uh, usually, uh, 44, 45 on the chill water coils and the chill water loop and even the chiller spec itself was the most common on a lot of older equipment. And 42 is now becoming a lot more common. Again, I'm not sure why. Uh, if anybody has any input on that, throw in the comments. I'd love to hear some perspective on that. But anyway, 48 is pretty typical for a building that's maybe going into the lighter load. So we've got some buildings right now that we have some fairly light load in the mornings and even during some of the days. Now this week in particular, we've had a, a hotter week, so they're pushing their set points back down. But there are buildings that consistently run a 48 degree set point. If you're not having humidity issues and you're mostly just worried about uh, processing the load down in terms of a sensible side, that's not really that big a deal. You can run 48 just fine. Uh, and this is during just a normal cooling summer. In the winter time, when we've got very light load conditions, uh, we've ran our set points as high as, you know, 50 to 52, uh, depending on the scenario. That was horrible. 50 to 52. I didn't do it much better that time anyway. <laughs> So that just the reason for that is just to take more load off of the uh, and get more efficiency, really. It just comes down to energy efficiency. And the whole reason why any of this matters and the whole reason we have uh, chill water set, uh, resets 
why they matter is purely for an efficiency perspective. So if you're not familiar with the chill water reset, uh, you can base that off of, a lot of times it, you can do it off of like return temperature coming back from the building. Once you get down uh, below a certain point, it'll do a reset. And what a, what a reset does is it raises through the chiller's logic, or you could do it through the automation too, raises the set point uh, by several degrees. Uh, that, that completely depends on the machine. But say, say you're running a 45 degree set point, and you wanna reset to 50. So when your uh, entering water temperature gets down to 48 or 50 degrees, the chiller can go into a chill water reset and it will run a 50 degree set point until the entering water gets back above 55, 60, whatever that threshold is that you set. And you can take that a step further and you can actually scale that. And so it'll become proportional to where um, once you enter into a reset mode, the closer, um, the closer you get to it re-engaging uh, the closer back to the original set point you, you travel. So that's just some of the, uh, that's just some of the, um, let's say the stream went black. Hang on. You still got me coming through clear? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on there, Kip. Anyway, that's, that's a typical reset. Now, another way you can do a reset is based off of outside air temperature. So you can have it to where once you exceed a certain temperature outside, chill water set point resets uh, to, you know, whatever degrees. And then once you get back above, so let's say a pretty typical point for me is if my outside air gets below say 60 or 55, I'm gonna reset back five or six or eight degrees on the chill water. And then if I get back above uh, say 65 or I'm pushing back up at 70, then I'll have that reset kick back out and I'll go back to the actual set point. So, uh, let's see. So, Sterling is in the UK. Uh, pretty sure I remember that right. It says 50 to 53 return, 44 to 46. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, that's something I'm seeing. So, a uh, uh, 42 leaving and a entering, I've seen them spec as high as a 56 entering and a 42 leaving. Uh, we've actually, uh, I just was look, reviewing a system that we're uh, specking out right now to put some centrifugals in. And that was the spec. That was the spec on the centrifugal was uh, 56 uh, entering uh, on the evaporator with a 42 leaving. So pretty interesting. I don't know. Uh, again, somebody with an engineering degree makes that decision. I just make it work. So, okay. We've got this, so when we think about uh, a regular air conditioning scenario, and we, we talked pretty heavily about how we can load control in the air-cooled class. So if we've got a scroll machine, scroll machines are pretty straightforward. You know, they have loading and unloading ability in 3D digital scrolls, and yada yada, and they are putting them on variable speed drives now. But uh, typically the scrolls, you know, your, your most effective way is they just, they turn off and on. And, as you need more, need less, it's, it's a very inefficient way of doing it, but it is one way to do it. Now, when we talk about, uh, coming back to our, some of our pictures from yesterday, when we talk about a screw machine, if you look there in the middle of that compressor cutout, uh, you'll see kind of a cylinder, a little disc shaped thing. That is a representation of the slide valve and, and that you can see. That is what is controlling the load inside of that machine. So uh, that slide, and I'll pull up one of these other breakdowns. You can see, um, uh, you can almost see it better than the other one. Anyway, that slide is what is uh, loading and unloading those screws. Ultimately, it's a fairly simple algorithm. As we're pulling down to set point, and we're, we're starting to approach set point, uh, once we hit it and exceed it, that compressor will start to back off. 
So like I said, in a scroll scenario, you either start unloading the compressors themselves or you start turning them off as you, as you need to. In a screw situation, we're gonna start sliding that uh, slide off of those bolts, opening up that compression. And so we've only got, you know, instead of having 100% of the bolt compressing, we get down to, you know, 70% or 50% of those bolts actually able to compress refrigerant and send it down the stream. Uh, and that, what that effectively does is that lowers our ability to cool the, uh, the water down and we're pulling less refrigerant off of the evaporator. So when we're moving less refrigerant volume, obviously we're going to move less BTUs. Uh, at that point, our goal is to lock in at that set point with as precise control as we can have and just cruise right there. And keep in mind, when you're dealing with chillers, it's not like a regular, whether it be RTU or any other system, you know, they they should never have to cycle, especially when you start dealing with screw or centrifugal machines. You do not want that compressor cycling. It just, it, it puts, so majority of your energy usage happens at startup or during that startup phase and down if you're constantly cycling. So you use a huge amount of energy to get that thing turning and get the refrigerant moving. So one of our main goals is to make sure that we're just not doing that. Um, we do that by having really precise load control. Now you're entering water uh, in, a, in a properly balanced building with, um, uh, with a proper load sizing. Your entering water should kind of catch its groove and maintain. Now uh, that could be an eight degree split on the building. That could be 10 degrees. You know, it really kind of depends. Uh, if you're running a lead lag system with multiple chillers, then usually the lag chiller won't engage until the lead chiller has reached 100% capacity for RLA and it needs to call for the second one. Or if there's like a building automation, for example, if the, uh, if the chill water set point that the automation is asking for, if the, if the chiller cannot maintain that within a couple of degrees uh, dead band for say like 30 minutes, you know, we're talking extended delay times here on staging. So if, we're, if our set point is 45 and say we get to 46 degrees, and we stay above 46 degrees for 30 minutes worth of time, that's when we would want to, uh, that's when the system would start looking at bringing in the lag chiller and having it come alongside and help out. Now, they, they can be more responsive than that. That really just depends on the system, but that's pretty common. Yes? When that would happen, because um, I'm used to like every, a lot of what you're explaining, like, you know, I'm obviously chillers is a little, it's still newer to me, but boilers do a lot of this. Know, they would they would do that they would bring on you know another boiler and then they would start throttling them both down Is yes that, that's the same it happens the same way yes absolutely okay. and so in in the same way we stage up by by not may, being able to maintain so the water gets too hot as that water temperature begins to drop uh, both chillers are going to unload themselves and when the system recognizes that, hey, okay, we're running at 44 degrees consecutively for X amount of time, both chillers have unloaded as much as possible, it's going to shut the lag down. And then as that chill water set point starts to creep back up, the lead chiller will then ramp up with it and grab control of that load. Mm -hmm. it's the exact same control theory is no different. Um, yeah. Now we've talked about, you know, we've talked about screws fairly heavily. Let's talk about a centrifugal. So the primary way that most or any centrifugal, well, I can't say any anymore. Thank you, York. Almost any centrifugal is going to use a PRV or an IGV. To, you know, this all means the same thing. So IGV 
is an inlet guide vein. A PRV is a pre-rotation vein. They're literally the same thing, just different manufacturers call it different things, such as VRV versus VRF. Uh, as far as I'm aware, York is the only one that uses the PRV terminology. Anyway, it doesn't matter. A visual representation of that is if you're looking at that diagram there in the... Uh, so you see the impellers, which we talked about yesterday at the middle of that compressor. Right to the left of those impellers where the suction elbow ties in, you'll see these little blade looking things sitting in there. That is your IGV assembly. So those are literal paddles and they'll be in a uh, triangular shape fashion. Uh, depending on the manufacturer will depend on how they're exactly designed. So York, yes, York uses an overlapping design, meaning that each of these um, is actually slightly overlapping the other. I should be drawing it like this. Yeah, need to remove that. So with, with York, they slightly overlap each other. I, I'll, I'll get to you in one second. Let me finish this thought. Um, with train and, let's see, I'm trying to think turbo core. Turbo core does overlap, does not, does not over, I don't remember. Anyway, point is some of them may overlap, some of them may not. What is really critical is that these tolerances between each blade is extremely minimal. So to give you an example, uh, York spec is if you can take a dollar bill, fold it over on itself four times, and then roll something across it to flatten it, nice and perfectly creased. And then you can fit that little creased dollar bill in between the blades where they're fully closed, it is very likely that chiller is not going to turn on. And I'll explain why in a minute. But that is how tight the tolerances are. Now, train's a little less restrictive. But again, train has that big, large impeller design that's low speed. So it's one of the, one of the benefits that they have. Uh, zoom in on the board. Um, not really. If I'm being honest, but I can draw bigger if that helps. Oh, duh. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. Thank you. Helps when you can. Anyway, I'm a professional, I swear. Uh, see, Sterling, when there's two screws or two circuit chiller, is it better to have the two screw only? The sec sorry, the second screw only come on once the first half of the load uh, run both. Yes, yes. So, uh, Sterling, you yeah, that's exactly part of how uh, whether whether the chiller itself or the chillers are networked together to where they're running their own independent control sequence, or whether they're doing it through a building automation. Both scenarios. Uh, that chiller, despite how many circuits it has, is going to fully stage up and fully stage down in this staging sequence. So, if, like I was uh, with that example, uh, the lead chiller isn't going to tell the other chiller to turn on until after it knows that both or all of its circuits, not just both, but all of its available circuits have fully staged up. And then uh, that's when it's going to call for it. And the building automation, that's one reason why they call for uh, you know, fairly extensive delays on the building automation side because uh, most of the time they're not monitoring the equipment that closely in terms of they're, they're, even though they may be networked, they're not paying attention to exact load parameters. What the building automation is really looking at is the leaving chill water. And that's what almost all of its decisions are being based off of. So um, by the time the building automation ever decided to call on the, the lag chiller, the lead chiller should have already had enough time 
to fully stage. And if you set those, uh, if you set that that uh, delay in the dead bands too tight, uh, that's when you can actually start running into some issues. And yes, you, you know, that's exactly what I mean. Is uh, two 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 compressors or two circuits on the same chiller? That's exactly what I mean. That that chiller is going to stage all of its circuits because they, they they despite how many circuits, despite how many compressors. It's going to stage itself up to 100% capacity. Now, I'm... His, he's saying his system is bringing both on that mode. That's what Let me read that a little closer. His, his, he's asking if it's better to bring on one and then hit the max and then bring on the second or bring on both that mode because his is running both that mode. Uh, it is better... It is better to run one, and from an efficiency perspective, it is better to run one uh, from the start to max, and then let let the other one come in and catch up uh, to the first one. In terms of a staging sequence, uh, that is that is better than having them both try to run together out the gate, because inevitably, when you actually compare BTU output to energy used, you'll see that having them both run together at low load, if, if one is capable of handling on its own, you end up using a lot more energy that way. For the exact same amount of BTUs. Yep, exactly. Uh, all right, so sorry, in case you couldn't see, this is my inlet guide vanes. So this would be a front shot looking directly at it if you're staring into the nose cone of a centrifugal compressor. Uh, directly behind this would be the uh, inlet cone of your impeller. And these are just paddles. And these paddles just pivot and rotate on hinges. And so they'll have uh, just a little bearing hinge. All of these will be linked together uh, through some apparatus, whether that be a bars uh, or bars and linkages, or I think it was a uh, carrier who had the bright idea to use um, uh, cables. And for anybody that got to work on that kind of system, it worked really well. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yes, this is your guide vane. This does two jobs. It has two primary jobs. Job number one and it's the whole reason why uh, it's I call it a guide vein is to rotate, is to create a pre-rotation on the refrigerant. Now this helps improve efficiency. So if we have refrigerant just moving in a straight line and then just slaps the nose of the impeller, that impeller has a lot more uh, force that it has to apply to those uh, refrigerant molecules in order to accelerate them to spin them out into the volute. Where if it comes into the rotation veins first, and, the, and those are typically at some kind of pitch, depending on the load, and I'll get to that part in a second, but um, it's able to get a literal pre-rotation. It's able to start to twist that refrigerant in the same direction that the impeller is spinning so that it can then it, the impeller has to apply less, uh, less um, load to it, or less force. There we go. That's the word. It, yes, I think. I'm actually not sure how to answer that. <laughs> um, so that is, that's his first primary function, is rotation. We want the refrigerant stream to rotate that reduces co energy costs through the motor to drive that impeller strictly by having this device. But that device also gives us a second critical feature. I would have, is it okay to cycle the screw off and on for that? Uh, please go slightly deeper on that question there, Jeff. Jet. Jet. Uh, you should have a minimum GPM to stage both at lower capacity if available, right? 
Yes, and that you say minimum GPM, that's saying that you have a variable uh, flow system to begin with. Uh, personally, I'm not a huge fan of variable flows, but they exist, they work, they're part of our system. Um, but yes, you, you need to make sure that you're paying attention to the GPM guidelines set per that chiller. All right, the second thing that the IGV gives us is uh, loading control by literally changing how much refrigerant is allowed to make it to the impeller. So if uh, when, when this when this is closed, we're essentially not allowing refrigerant through now. Obviously, it doesn't make a perfect seal, so it's not that there's no refrigerant, but we're talking, it might as well be, to the extent that these are able to unload. This is extremely critical for startup. So, uh, centrifugal impellers require a lot of torque to start them and make them turn on. And it, the if they have any kind of a load on them, then more, it's, it's going to overload the electrical system on that, uh, on that chiller and on that building. It's just, it's, it can't do it. It's too much. So one of the benefits of the IGV is, and it's the reason why these have to close to such tight parameters, is when they close off and they're blocking that refrigerant from hitting that nose, uh, it's not able to, there's nothing to pump. So essentially, you're almost uh, dry running is not a really great way to say it, but you could think of it that way. You're, you're dry running that impeller to where it's not, it doesn't have anything to input into it. Right. Well, yeah, we're not talking oil. We're talking, talking refrigerant. But uh, yes, that impeller is then able to spin up and get up to speed, and that chiller will run at that state for several seconds to a couple of minutes depending on uh, depending on your parameters and it does that so that everything can stabilize the motor can get to the rpm it wants to and everything can start to level out on the machine and then your guide vanes will start to slowly crack and creep open the more they open the more refrigerant you move the more btus you move the more you're going to cool that water down and it's pretty well as simple as that so if you, um, uh, if you walk up and you see that you're, uh, you see that you're running significantly below set point, uh, you, you can look at the, the front panel on the chiller and see, you know, what is my, what IGV position am I calling for? And it may even tell you it's calling for 0%, but you can actually look at the armature because all those things are external. Uh, so if we cycle, actually, I don't know if you can even see it. If we cycle back over, oh, yeah, you can. So right there below where those IGVs are or the, uh, on this chiller, you'll see there's an armature assembly on the outside of it that is not in the refrigerant stream. That is the uh, IGV control armature. And there's an actuator attached to that that drives that arm up and down and swings it. And every manufacturer has their own basic version of this, but they all do the same thing. And that is, that is how we're able to, um, that's how we're able to control it. And so you can literally look at that armature and see what, uh, what literal position it is in visually. Now, granted, this is all saying that something in, inside the uh, the inside the compressor hasn't come apart, and we've got veins doing things they're not supposed to. But barring that, and everything inside is working properly, uh, you, those actuators do fail, or the linkages sometimes bind up. You know, things happen. Um, train does not have a monitor or no train is using uh, I think they've got a internal sensor on the actuator and train is communicating over the bus uh, the communication bus to talk to the uh, IGV actuator but York 
uses a, a, a rheostat or potentiometer, whatever term you want to use for that, uh, on the end of the positioning um, uh, shaft and so that it's able to track via resistance what position we're in. Yeah, it's, it's a reference feedback at that point so that it can confirm itself that I'm supposed to be at 0%, but I'm not actually at 0%. Which is why, like, when it's off and you turn it on, it does the calibration. Right? Yeah, that's one of the things it's checking for. It wants to see the uh, feedback position modulating as it drives the actuator. So if I remember correctly, trains is built into the actuator. I think it has a reference feedback. I could be wrong on that. Uh, York's is definitely a separate component. Anyway, uh, so yes, motor spinning, compressors running. We uh, we're seeing that we're not at set point either above or below. So for example, if you're below set point or above set point, especially by one or two degrees, unless you are having some kind of limiter, which should be displaying on your chiller controls, uh, you should be able to physically watch that armature swing those PRVs one way or the other. So if you need to unload the machine, they're gonna close. If you need to load the machine to pull more, pull it down further, the water, uh, you're going to see them open. Uh, this should be a very slow process. These armatures are not going to swing quickly. You're not going to just see it just wrench right up. It's going to be slow, small, little incremental steps, and it should be. Uh, these compressors, you know, they, they don't take very kindly to dramatic swings super fast. They, they, they'll give you... Uh, they'll fight back. Uh, see, the guide vanes closing decreases current draw just like uh, restricted airflow lowers amp draw on the blower. Exactly. Yep. That is right. On a PSC. Hmm? On a PSC. Right. Uh, yes. Yes, it does. It keeps the amp draw lower because we don't have any input. Same reason why, you know, when we unload the screw compressor uh, and so that slide valve moves, it doesn't have as, you know, current draw is proportional to load. Load is proportional to how much refrigerant we're moving. So as we lower the load on the screw bolts or the impeller, either way you look at it, we are reducing the current draw required to turn it because that is effectively horsepower. If you put uh, the current limiter on, you know, like say you set it for 60%, is that automatically going to dictate how far those, those veins open and close? Yes, and that's actually a wonderful segue. So if you have, so let's say, let's say we have a pull down, uh, a pull down sequence that the chiller goes into at startup, which it should. Uh, you, you want your chiller to have that. Um, it's going to limit how much these veins open because two things decide, or really it's more than that, but this is where we start talking safeties, okay? So one thing that controls the veins is deviation from set point, right? We need to get to our set point depending on how we're deviated from it, will depend whether we open close. The second thing is we have current limiters. So when current is not directly tied to the position of this, just like uh, on a, a screw compressor, just because you, you, when you say, give me 100% load, in reality, or same thing on a, on a centrifugal, when I say I want to I load this machine to 100%, I'm not talking about these IGVs being wide open, and I'm not talking about this, the slide on the screw being at full 100% uh, position. What I'm talking about is our RLA current ratio. So um, if our RLA is 200 amps, 
When I say give me full load, 100%, I'm talking run that compressor and load it up until I hit 200 amps and then stop. So keep that in mind. 100% load doesn't mean guide vanes are wide open. So especially with a pull down, 20% vein may be 100% RLA and it's going to stop. If you're having issues with a chiller surging, uh, a trick you can do, or if you're trying to keep it from going into a surge, is run your current limiter down. You know, set it down, whatever you decide, 60%, 50%, you know, you choose, but lower your current limit, and that's going to force these veins to close, and it's going to help you uh, uh, stop and prevent you, your machine pushing itself into a surge condition. And I'll get into surge and all that later as we have time. That's, that's not the... Anyway, um, so a current limit. Current limit is another thing that's going to restrict how much these veins are allowed to open. Another thing would be a, uh, a suction limit or low suction pressure limit. So if for whatever reason, whether it be water issues or the gambit of problems, if for any reason your suction pressure is too low, it's not going to let this continue to load the machine. It's going to stop it. Even though you're under the current limit, even though you still haven't made set point, you know, you're still trying to pull down, that suction pressure will stop you. And what can happen, just because you start cycling a low suction pressure limit or, or low, low pressure limiter, right? That doesn't mean there's something wrong. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong at all. What that means is the machine is loading a little faster than the refrigerant circuit can keep up. So uh, this is really common on screw machines. I see this all the time with screws, but I've seen centrifugals do it too, where the uh, just you given the right conditions, that compressor will load faster than the metering devices are able to supply it refrigerant. And if, if it didn't have that limiter, it would literally just pull the... Um, uh, it would pull the suction pressure down to the point of tripping a low pressure safety. Uh, well, it's not, it wouldn't be closing the metering device. It would, you, you literally pull down to the point of tripping safety. So your low pressure switch would trip. So that suction limiter is another thing that can help protect us. Now, uh, if you are having some kind of water issue or if a water issue popped up while the machine was online, say for whatever reason, uh, the, your variable speed flow just dipped too low for any condition, right? You're going to start seeing that suction limiter as a means of keeping the machine on without having to shut down that suction limiter because you for your variable water flow now became too low is going to force that machine to back off on the load to try to get that suction pressure up because first it's going to stop it it's not going to let it go any further and then it should as that suction pressure doesn't come back up the way it wants it to after based off of the 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 pid it's going to start backing that load off on the compressor so that it can not trip out which honestly, a lot of times when you start seeing those kind of conditions, um, if it is legitimately severe enough that uh, it's not it's not the compressor loading causing it, it's some kind of external source, uh, it will end up tripping on low pressure before the compressor can keep up. Uh, we got some questions. Uh, do some. Do centrifugal not like running at low load for extended periods of time like screws don't like it as regards to oil return, motor cooling from these suction gases. So centrifugals are not uh, suction cooled, um, at least not in the traditional sense. I don't know. Maybe that's a wrong statement. I may not. I may should retract that. But um, the motors themselves won't be necessarily suction cooled directly. 
I'll put it that way. Uh, anyway, ultimately, no. They don't like low loads for long periods of time, but they will do it, uh, just like a screw will. Um, depending on the exact conditions, yes, it could lead to oil return issues, migration issues. You know, it could lead to things. Uh, but that also plays into, uh, so something we have more control of with water-cooled equipment is our condenser side. So if even if we're in a low load condition, it, we can manipulate our condenser water set point so that it can help you know, I guess give the compressor more lift and load or just whatever parameters you need in order to maintain oil return and things. Stuff that is a lot harder to do, if even possible, with a air-cooled machine. We can we can take that a whole lot further with a water-cooled. Um, let's see. When the pressure suction is too high, uh, I'm going to say what then is what you were trying to say. Uh, what happens, yeah. So if your suction pressure runs high, typically, I mean, the system, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any, uh, any direct alarm. Um, yeah, it just, it's, it's running higher. I can't, I'm, I'm trying to just think of a scenario where that would be a, a problem. I mean, if you got high load, it's going to run high because again, you know, PT chart. Uh, but yeah, it's not, it's not typically too much of an issue. Right. Well, that'd be the thing is, is you got a high load, you got a high inlet water. It's going to drive your suction pressure up pretty high. Right. Uh, what about oilless compressors on low load conditions? Oilless, actually, so that's one of the major benefits that they have because that's that's the ultimate, uh, probably most uh, detrimental factor to oiled machines is is the load conditions, and you have to keep the lift and velocity at set minimums and the temperatures so that the oil viscosity as long as, as well as the refrigerant velocity is able to properly move and, and return the oil where it needs to go without it collecting in the wrong place. Um, oilless machines obviously don't have that problem. So yeah, the short answer is they, they can maintain low load conditions without any real concern as long as you can maintain motor cooling. That's, that's the main thing. Um, you know, you're going to have some kind of, uh, usually it's like a liquid injection type into the stator in order to maintain your, your system cooling. So as long as you can maintain that, depending on whatever conditions you have, you'll be fine. Uh, all right, let's take this PRV control a step further. Now, if you notice, I'm very much using PRV and IGV interchangeably. That is on purpose. I really want to drive it home that these are interchangeable terms. They mean the same thing. Anyway, just pointing that out. By modern standards, you might walk up to a machine and you're going to see that the, uh, the IGV is wide open, 100% and is maintaining, you know, uh, you know, it's maintaining a set point just fine and say you've got 50 degree entering water. Uh, there's no reset or anything on the system. So uh, that seems kind of weird, right? You know, if my IGV is load control and it's at 100% open, but I'm at set point with half of my load, right? So most machines are designed for a 10 degree split across the heat exchanger, right? So let's say that's the case. Uh, you know, uh, max load on the machine should be 45 in, 55, or I'm sorry, 55 in, 45 out. That doesn't make any sense. Well, that's because it's variable speed. So in that scenario, vast majority of centrifugals coming out today 
they uh, they have some kind of variable speed control on them. Most specifically, they've got a VFD of some sort, whether it be uh, an OEM direct like York has their own personal, I say it's personal, I think they technically go through a vendor. Anyway, York has their own drive. Train uses a Danfoss variant. Train used to use, uh, man, who were they? No, that's York. Uh, train, who did Train use? It wasn't Tico. Uh, I don't even know that they're in production. Anymore. Anyway, they don't use them anymore. Now they're using a Dan Foss variant. But anyway, um, their VFDs come with that installed. Uh, that may be right. Yeah, I don't remember. I haven't, uh, we've had some of those in the past. I've worked on them locally, but I uh, haven't had to touch them in quite some time. And I, anyway, yeah. Uh, so, yes, a VFD. There's a VFD in there. So what? this is another level of loading control. And this is also a way of gaining efficiency. So uh, as the machine is running, you know, we've got a set RPM that we're running at at 60 hertz. All right, so at 60 hertz, the York may be running at 25,000 RPM and the train is running, um, what did I say, 3,600 RPM, right? And with that, we everything I just talked about applies to how the IGV is controlling. Well, let's say uh, that dry, you know, our load is coming down and with the algorithms built into the machine's control and the PID loops, it decides that, hey, I can, uh, based, off, based off of my surge curve, so there is surge maps uh, for every compressor. Uh, I think most of the time you can even request those. Uh, I know York specifically, you have to ask for it, that's, and they won't always give it to you. But anyway, each compressor has a surge map designed for it to where you, as you it's basically your lift, your PRV position, your compressor speed. It's got several parameters built into that. And if you get outside of the basically right side of the graph into more of the left end, you're in surge installed territory. It's almost like a pump curve. Yeah, it's a centrifugal compressor's version of a pump curve, honestly. You could think of it that way. So... Um, what it uh, uh, based off of that chart, that chart is built into an algorithm inside of the chiller controls. It knows that, hey, I can ramp my motor speed down. But we want to we don't want to change our BTU output. So we have to think of these things now as proportional to each other. So now we have our motor on a VFD driven. So as the VFD slows down, if we're going to maintain the same amount of BTU output, our PRV has to open. So this is going to slow and open. And so they're directly proportional to each other. This allows us to take, without, without, changing, uh, without changing our BTU output, so we're able to hold fast on that 45 degrees, but we're able to reduce our current even further. And the reason this happens that way is because we're spinning that impeller slower. So there is less centrifugal force being applied and because there's less force being applied, we can feed more refrigerant into the nose of it without driving our amperage up. And that's where, by backing off on the speed, we're able to maintain the same output. Uh, and by also simultaneously opening this. It's a wonderful design, and it works really well. And that's why everybody, everybody has moved to this. I can't think of any machine we've put in in the last five years, heck, maybe even 10 years, 
that hasn't been a variable speed compressor. This is this is this is where the industry is. Anyway, um, do 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 do. Now, just to mention them, uh, you do have three other types of starter assemblies. They the other three are they're not variable. They're just constant. Okay. So you have an XL, which is a straight across the line. It's just like a contactor on a split system, hammer and shut. Now you're not going to see that on a centrifugal. At least if one exists, I would be really interested to see the size of that thing. <laughs> um, send me pictures. Anyway, you would see something like an XL on a small screw machine. You could see XLs not on you know, like so I've seen screws up to a hundred tons. Uh, run an XL start. Um, but the most common in our area, at least, would be more of a wide delta start. So we see a, a, on the older machines before VFDs really started to take over the market, wide delta was a very common uh, choice. Now, something that I'm going to throw out here that I didn't realize for a long time, I misunderstood, there is a difference in Y delta motors and Y delta power feed. And it's two different terminologies. So when you talk about the power feed to a building, uh, most of them in our area are a Y transformer. I don't, I don't think we service any building currently that has a delta feed into it. And you would know you have a delta feed because you have what they call a, a wild leg. You know, you have one leg, you read it to ground, and it's going to be some weird, wacky voltage, right? It's going to be off. Uh, and that can kind of vary. And that is uh, a, a symptom of a, of a delta transformer. If you're not familiar with any of that at all, your delta transformer is going to be a triangle. And you can actually go, if you're ever curious, next time you're in one of your commercial buildings, walk up to one of the transformers in the electrical room and actually read the tag. And you'll see these schematics on there and it should tell you what type of transformer it is. So this is your Y configuration. This is your Delta configuration. As I said, almost basically everything we are gonna work on in our area is gonna be a Y. Um, but all of our motors, almost all of our motors are Delta. Well, it's even beyond the 460. They're, they're Delta configuration, despite the, you know, they could be 208, right? They're Delta configuration. The Delta symbol stays the same. And that's part of what, and that's part of what tripped me up for a long time is, is how I misunderstood it. Um, uh, this is the, uh, the three contactor starter, right? Star Delta or whatever they call it. But yes, yeah, Star Delta is another another term that's for what it. I've always heard it as yep. a Star Delta with the three contactors. Uh, I, I think that's kind of regional, but I, I've seen Star Delta. Uh, I've, I've come up calling it Y Delta. I knew what you were saying. Anyway, if you look at a motor tag, uh, not every motor, but some of them, you'll see there's two different ways to configure. You can wire that motor for Delta, which is the standard uh, for us at least. And then you have a Y configuration. Uh, and this could depend on just the setup that you have. Anyway, the, the a motor Y or Delta is not dependent upon the building's power feed for Y and Delta. It's based off of how the, uh, the, the voltage, I guess it, it comes down to whether you have a, a low voltage or high voltage, which what I mean by that is 460 or 208. So you may be, you may be right. I think 208, we wire Y. 460, we roll a delta. That's right. See? 74, you know, all the numbers lined up in delta. That's why you hire good people, guys. They can remember stuff you sometimes forget. I pay when I'm paying good money. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, we have, uh, so yes, 
the vast majority of our motors we run 460 and so they they run a delta configuration uh, don't let that mix you up now that being said a centrifugal given the size of it is going to be running you know on a commercial cooling application we're not talking industrial we're not talking industrial voltages you know so just again bear that in mind this is not talking industrial you know was it 2160 yeah you got they're 41 yeah so you've got you know your your true medium voltage so those guys would consider what we do low voltage you know and they're working on medium and true high voltage systems we are working on from an electrician's perspective a low voltage system but from our perspective high voltage means 460. yeah it's something like that uh anyway yes so all of our centrifugals are going to be a 460 volt input what that does when you have a y uh, a y delta start you've got uh three contacts and so the control system it knows that this is your main uh this is your main contacts this is your uh secondary Secondary, I'm coming up with my own terms now. You'll get the point. You got your main, your secondary, and then your start. Maybe I should make that one start. We'll call this one P. There we go. Anyway, point is, this will be a pretty typical configuration. This contact is one half of the delta sequence. This is the other half of the delta sequence. This has a bunch of and you'll see them come out a bunch of jump legs and this converts the delta sequence into a y sequence and so you'll see the start pattern on this is you'll hit you'll hit the start and then within seconds it'll kick out and you'll hit the primary and what you did there is when these two hit, you kicked the motor into a Y sequence. And the reason we did this was to get pre-rotation happening on the motor shaft so that we weren't starting from a lock rotor. Because we can do that in a Y configuration at a lower current load than from a delta. And then after, the, after so many seconds and we've established uh, rotation, the Y contact drops and the Delta contact hits. And now when both of these are engaged together, we have, we have the motor in a Delta configuration at that point. So that is your, uh, your Y Delta starting sequence. Solid state is, uh, it was actually some pretty interesting stuff. I, I it was an alternative to uh, it was, or it's, I guess, a precursor to VFD, but a solid state. It basically, imagine if you're familiar with SCRs technology for heaters, right? Uh, you've got a silicone controlled rectifier, which is the solid state, uh, and, and it essentially it, it pulsed. It did a PWM signal. So it did a pulse width modulation to do exactly what Sterling just said. It's a soft start. And it's just another alternative to a wide delta. A wide delta is a type of soft starting system. XL would be considered a hard starting system. So y, y delta, solid state, and VFDs use soft starting technology. So a solid state uh, just pulses the electronic gates uh, from a low, you know, frequency and ramps that drive up, but they're not made uh, to, um, they're not made to, to run as a variable system like a VFD is. Once they meet that 60 hertz uh, um, threshold at the top end, you know, and it's in the motors up to full speed, they lock closed and they're just a straight power path at that point. And so the, you know, the, the triac 
core inside of there just locks to a what would be a, a closed or a positive state, however you want to look at that, to send that power through to the motor. So it's just able to run as if that component basically was just a straight across the line. Uh, it doesn't have the um, doesn't have the cooling capacity, or it just doesn't have the controls. That that technology wasn't designed so it, it doesn't have like the vf the, it doesn't have the capacitor bank or the inverters or anything else in there to do what vfds do it's it's a solid state control system that just slowly ramps the motor up but it uses very similar principles to what a vfd does again if you're familiar with uh ser heaters then you should have a fairly good understanding of a solid state um, solid state starter. Anyway, all of these parameters still apply in the same when it comes to the IGV. It doesn't matter if it's a screw machine either. It's going to apply the same theory. That screw uh, compressor should start at a fully unloaded state. So you want it to crank up at minimum. Now it's not going to have the same um, well, it'll still overcurrent. So if a screw compressor tries to start with any kind of load on it, the parameters inside of that compress or inside of the control system is going to see that and it's still going to cut the thing off because it says, hey, some, something ain't right here. But for the most part, um, that screw will still be able to turn in ways that a centrifugal will literally just stay lock rotor. It, it, the motor doesn't have enough torque in the design to spin it past that load that's on there, where screws uh, are able to fight through that. It's our time. We're actually making better time than I felt like we were doing yesterday. How about that? Um, from here, uh, yeah. The compressors with the drive, how does, how does that respond when, when, it, when you're starting up? How you're saying it needs to start on does the compressor just like soft starter, just kind of slowly start working its way up? Is it kind of like yeah. the same, same yes. principles? Yes. Every one of these starting systems that I, that the slide valve or the guide vanes are going to start at a full unload. And they're going to stay there until that compressor reaches speed, operating speed. So the first thing that any of them should do is, you know, a VFD, obviously solid state because it can't run less than that. But even a VFD, a VFD is going to take that compressor to um, 60 hertz first. And then once it gets there and it gets the machine started and everything is starting to stabilize, then it will start to back that thing down. So it's not like a bowl where you have your Excel and decel type. No, you still have Excel D cell. I'm just curious uh, how that how that plays into it because I'm only used to that with blowers. I mean, obviously this is not really my realm. Well, yet. so if, if anybody's familiar, if you've been around long enough to see the, you had IGVs before you had uh, VFDs inside of air, inside of air handlers and RTUs. Yeah, the train. You know the old train Voyager mm -hmm. systems uh, before they went to VFD, they used uh, inlet guide vanes. It's the exact same operating theory because uh, those started with the guide vanes closed and it kept motor amperage down. And as the once the motor got up to speed and you started to need to maintain static set point on the ductwork, then they would yeah they would start to open after a delay. Um, and yeah, you could you could you'd get the static under control, uh, but. It's, you know, now we've got VFDs, and so we usually will go in and lock those guide vanes open on an air handler and just let the VFD do its thing to maintain static. Totally, totally different scenario at that point. Uh, something, I'm not the most qualified person to explain this, and I'm going to put the theory out there, and it's a little advanced, and very few of us, in my opinion, really understand it on a crazy deep level. Uh, 
some of us definitely do. I've worked with plenty of chiller techs who really understand it much better than I do. Anyway, um, you know, with a positive displacement system that doesn't use centrifugal theory, so a screw compressor, it is creating pressure as it's compressing the refrigerant. A centrifugal, theoretically, doesn't actually compress and create pressure. It slings molecules is a better way to think of a centrifugal impeller. And it's literally just throwing them. And there is a, uh, I guess I'm running out of room here, aren't I? You can make some space. There is a vein or a chamber vein. There's a lane, however you want to call it. Actually, you know what? Instead of me, I'm going to throw, while I'm drawing it, I'll let y'all kind of stare at this for a second. Uh, let me find it here. Okay. What I want you to really look at is that impeller. You see where the, the outer edges of the impeller is in the middle of the picture, about midway. Uh, you, let me see if I can zoom into this even. Not super, oop, that's not what I wanted. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, I'm at the, I'm still figuring this software out. Anyway, if uh, there's a tiny little crevice, and I mean a tiny little crevice, where the refrigerant should technically flow, that crevice is your uh, diffuser plates or chamber or lanes. That is where pressure is actually created. Let me see. I'll let, well, let me see if I can articulate this from a drawing. So, and I'll, I'll blow it up on the big screen in a second. So just while I'm drawing it, y'all look at it. But in this picture, you're seeing you've got your volutes coming through. And you've got this tiny little chamber. And then you've got your impeller. Uh, and this is going to track with the face of that. And then you'll have the bottom of the volute coming through. We're going to track out. So refrigerant's going this way, and it's going to come out of there. All right. I'll switch over to me now. So if you look over here, this was kind of what you were looking at just on a simplified scale. The uh, refrigerant comes into the nose and the impeller slings it. And there's a tiny little channel right here. This is where as those molecules get thrown into the um, volute assembly, they stack in this tiny little chamber and it's necessary for it to be as small as it is so that we can actually create pressure and they can then the molecules then begin to compress uh, uh, they begin to compress against each other and you know as we're just constantly throwing more and more and more and more and more molecules into that by molecules I mean refrigerant and eventually, you know, it all compresses and it builds pressure as it gets pushed, literally pushed out into the volute. And by the time it reaches the volute assembly, which then spins down into the condenser, pressure has been created. And it's been converted from a centrifugal force and being thrown, being channeled into this tiny little channel. I think it's a good way to say it, where it then gets compressed and then out into the volute. Stay the same width all the way? Or 
Yes. Yep. Nope. It, it it stays it stays fairly consistent, or it may maybe it narrows down a little bit. We can. I couldn't tell you the name. I guess if if you look at this picture, you'll see that it, you know now having seen my drawing and seeing this one again, uh, it does narrow slightly, uh, but for the most part, it's 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 roughly the same basic size. Uh, yeah, here we go. So uh, in, the, in the diffuser, the kinetic energy developed in the impeller or the velocity is converted into potential energy in the form of pressure development. That is a fantastic uh, definition. Thank you. That helps. Uh, that, and that is exactly what happens. We're converting one form of energy into another. And that diffuser section is what allows that to happen. So this is, this is something that I honestly, this fairly advanced theory, it's not something you need to spend a ton of time into knowing down pat. That's something you can just learn along the way. But you've heard it, and you have the concept, and now you can do something with it as you go. I will throw one other component out there, and this is one way that York... Uh, is able to control surge, and I'm going to ex explain surge and stall next. Um, York, and actually, I think now that I say that, I think Train has come out with their own version of this. Uh, anyway, it's a VGD, a variable geometry diffuser. So York's version of this is they came in here and put this big metal ring that has the ability to slide in and out to either tighten or open the diffuser gap. Now at full open, it would just be as if that ring wasn't there. Uh, but at full close, we can, we can pinch down the, uh, the diffuser's gap, which what that does is that helps us to overcome a high lift scenario where we're trying to force refrigerant downstream, but we're starting to overload what the impeller can do, which leads us into talking about surge. So you have two conditions. You have a, you have a stall, which then leads into a surge. A stall will prelude the surge. Um, a stall can happen one of two ways. To represent this, I think I'll actually just use the impeller. Okay. So we've been looking at it from this way pretty much all night. Nose cone coming out into the diffuser assembly. So as we're feeding this impeller, what can happen is we create so much deferential across it from the nose to the out, going into the diffuser, into the volute, meaning your, your difference between suction pressure and discharge pressure becomes too great. What can happen is uh, the uh, veins in here, so each one of these openings is referred to as a vein. These veins will literally stop moving refrigerant. It will quit throwing your refrigerant out. And you'll have, you know, say just one or two veins at first. You know, that'll kind of start the stall process. And you'll have, as, as the condition worsens, two, or you'll get to up to three or four veins and five or six veins. And eventually enough veins will stall, meaning that the refrigerant that's inside that vein will just stop moving. And it'll stay in there as it rotates. While the other veins are still throwing refrigerant. Uh, after that gets to past a certain threshold, the impeller can no longer maintain the positive pressure over the lower pressure side, and the refrigerant will literally flow in reverse, and it'll push its way back through the outlet side of the impeller, and force it back out through the uh, inlet side. It'll reverse flow. 
And this ideally usually might only happen for just a matter of seconds at a time. So uh, depending on how severe the condition is. But this is extremely taxing on the compressor and on the bearings. Uh, you have uh, a lot of axial thrusts. So that means that the in and out thrust becomes very severe. That can cause rubbing on the impeller to the housing or the limbrance seal. Um, it causes a lot of problems. And it can only, the chiller is only going to take so many surges before it's just done. It's going to wear those compress those bearings out. Uh, that is, in its core function, what a surge is. And the reason we stop surging is because the surge is literally uh, lowering the lift. So your lift drops because you're no longer moving refrigerant and because it's actually able to reverse flow, it essentially slightly begins to equalize the refrigerant, uh, which is what you needed to have happen in order to drop your lift and allow the machine to turn, return to normal operation. Uh, I said there's two types of stalls, by the way. The second type doesn't truly matter. Uh, I, I guess it could technically mean slightly different conditions, but you can have what's called a, a, um, uh, a rolling, rolling stall. Is that the terms of rolling, rotating, something like that. Anyway, where when you have a, we're just going to stick with rolling stall. Instead of just one or two uh, veins stopping flow and stalling out, you actually end up having the veins rotate and it will rotate around vein to vein in a in a in a continuous pattern and slowly more and more veins will continue to stall and rotate around um, and what stall does you can actually hear a stall beginning to happen before the surge takes place that's if it's not an extreme case so in an extreme case let's say you had really high condenser water because the cooling tower had issues, it had some kind of flow problem, whatever, right? You can just, that thing will, will go straight through stall and just into a surge rapidly. It, it, it can happen that quick. But a lot of the times, especially in a low load condition, as that machine begins to unload, the uh, you'll hear the compressor begin to kind of growl and it's got a grumble to it and it genuinely begins to kind of sound uh, unbalanced because that's basically what's happening as those veins stall the literal weight balance of the refrigerant and those veins that aren't moving any refrigerant anymore begins to impact the balance on that impeller enough to where you can hear the, the imbalance happening inside the impeller while it's spinning. And this is one of the best tools you'll ever have working on specifically centrifugals is your hearing. Now they're typically very loud machines uh, some much less than others, but you need to, anytime you're around a centrifugal, you need to start listening. You need to really tune your ears to the noises that it's making. Because as you begin to learn each of those sounds, uh, and, and it's going to change slightly, you know, a CVH stall doesn't sound exactly like a YK stall, but they're not that far apart either. So anyways, it's something to pay attention to. You can hear the stall condition begin to build and you can hear it get worse and worse until eventually you cross that threshold and it goes into a surge. Um, anyway, the VGD, which manufacturers are starting to implement, like I said, York, I think was one of the first or was the first to implement it. I think they were the first to implement it. Uh, 
Oh, there you go. But uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, Train has their own version of this now. Um, anyway, its goal is to reduce the diffusion ch channel by literally pinching it down to make it smaller, which helps convert more of that energy, which will help you fight the, uh, the high lift condition. And it will reduce the it'll reduce the risk of running into a stall. So, um, sorry, you're reading some. Yeah, that's no, good. No, this is this is a great side of the industry to get involved in. Um, hopefully, hopefully. Hopefully this isn't too far over everybody. I'm trying to keep this uh, as simple as I can while still you still hearing the live conversation. Like this is everything I'm saying here for the most part. This is the terminology. This is the way you, you talk and grow and do. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, growl. That's 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 how it's always seemed to me. Is they just they've got they have a, it's a very distinct growl and it's, and it's different. So when the IGV is fully closed, now you get some kind of, you know, stalling happening because the IGV is closed. So then that, that is kind of a thing. Um, because you got to think about it as those IGVs pinch down, the suction pressure you're reading on the evaporator is not the actual pressure coming into the inlet of the nose because it's restricted down. So you, now you're actually technically pulling the pressure coming into the inlet of the nose lower than your evaporator pressure is because the veins are closed far enough. So that is that will push you into kind of a, a stall state um, without you know, having a high lift that is readable from the display or anywhere else. Anyway, we're, we're not going to sit on that too much because that could get kind of confusing. Um, so, but that is legitimately one of the ways. So if you didn't have a VGD, which that's a fairly new for a lot of machines. I think York ships that standard now. It used to be an option you could purchase separate uh, or as, as an addition to. Um, now it, it comes standard, I think, on their uh, YK series at minimum, if not across the board. But uh, the train one, I'm pretty confident, would be an option uh, or optional. Uh, my, where I'm going with that is that is not standard across the board, and it's going to take a long time before that type of tech makes it out there. So. All right, so we're working on a machine that doesn't have a variable geometry diffuser. All right. Uh, the way that we can capture how or stop this, the surging is one, closing the guide veins. That is, that is an immediate way because even though the way that the closing the guide veins helps is it lowers how much refrigerant is being pushed. And so it allows less refrigerant to stack um, in the in the uh, in the diffuser and going into the volutes so there's less molecules moving and so because of that we're if essentially uh, removing the the lift out of the out of the equation or we're, we're reducing the lift down enough to where we're not going to stall at that point now say you have a system where you're in a pinch okay we have this bank of chillers and the uh, we have two cooling towers that serve it. One of those cooling towers went down. It lost its fan, whatever, you name it. We don't have a cooling tower now. We needed both of those towers to maintain this system. The service call came in because our chillers were surging. All right, so you walk up, chillers got a surge. You're going to walk up to the display. You're going to see on that display that one, you're probably not maintaining chill water set point because of the surging. Uh, it can't pull it down. 
but you're also going to see that your condenser water is really high. We're talking, you know, upper 80s, 90 something degrees. Uh, it can get higher. So we have a really high condenser water, which at that point you should immediately, one, we need to stop the chiller, stop the surging from happening. Uh, you, can, you can go straight to lowering the current limit if you want to try to catch it. But uh, my personal opinion, if it's happening like that, I'm going to stop that machine. I'm going to then go in and make the adjustment to the current limit and then let the machine come back up so that it can come back at a more stable state and we're not already on the edge of surging then trying to back out of it because that means you probably still have a couple of more surge opportunities in there before you reach the new current limit set point that you just put in place that's my personal recommendation anyway once you've got that under control and the chillers are no longer surging, you should then make a trip to the cooling tower and see why in the world is my water so hot? Because, well, that's what controls that. Uh, that's when you get to diagnose the fan issue and realize that you've only got half of your condenser water cooling capacity. All right. So we're in a situation. We needed two towers. We only have one tower but we also still need to provide cooling to this building. Could you bring in a rental and spend a whole bunch of money or, you know, sure, in reality, rentals may not be available. Rentals may not be an option. They may not have taps in their systems to even handle a rental. So you gotta think about that. Second thing is, uh, you know, they say, okay, well, we just get the parts. Well, parts may not be available for another three weeks or, or, or longer. Uh, so now what we can't get the parts rentals, not an option. We need to provide cooling to this system. Use your current limit, uh, run that limit down. You probably won't get this system to run at capacity. And so that 45 degree set point is a dream and a dream only, but you know, 50 something degree water and a cool-ish building uh, is better than, you know, and, and server rooms that are not over temping is better than no cooling at all. And the machines will run at that state. And what that does, so the reason the current limit helps is, is we're not pushing the condenser water as hard. And so because we're not pushing the condenser water in terms of heat, we don't need as much cooling tower to keep the water cooler. And that's kind of the safe, the tricky point. And so that's what I would do is in terms of, okay, where do I set my current limit? How high do I go with it? If I have the time, you know, like I, I'll use the train CVH, for example, the minimum current limit on most of those is 40%. I'm going to start at 40%. I'm going to let the machine come up and I'm going to let it stabilize. And if I have other machines in series or in, in the, in the, in the plant, I may let those come in as well. Just kind of depend on the situation. Yeah. Anything that's running would have to be current limited period. So, uh, what I would do at that point is once the machine stabilizes and it's doing as much cooling as it's going to do, I'm going to bump that current limit up, you know, five, 10 percent at a time and let it restabilize. And where I'm going to stop is when my condenser water begins to run outside of what I'm comfortable with for that system. So if my leaving water or entering water gets above whatever condition you have, um, that is your breakover point. Stop raising the current limit and then maybe even drop it down slightly to give yourself some buffer in case you have a little bit hotter day tomorrow or a little bit more humid day tomorrow because those things are going to affect how well that cooling tower can keep up by itself until you get the other one repaired. Uh, Yeah, basically, Chris, um, they, they, you see 
you see the most effectiveness. I'm going to say it that way. They're the most effective when they're not quite into a surge or stall, but they're riding that fine line. Uh, you don't want to be in a stall condition, but um, you're, you're getting the most out of that machine you're going to get when you're riding that, that line. Uh, so what condenser water temp would you say is good and what is too high on a centrifugal? Well, uh, that, that comes back to your lift. You have to factor in your lift and your set point. Uh, so in a commercial cooling application like us with a 45 set point, uh, and depending on my chiller, so I'm going to say I'm going to use a train, train CVH. I know that I can push that chiller, especially a CVHE, for example. I can push that chiller to where my inlet water is able to get right at the edge of 90 degrees, 88 to 90 degrees. And when I start to get to that point and my entering chill water is floating in the mid 50s and I'm achieving 45 out, I'm riding that surge line right there for a machine that was designed for those conditions. I'm right there on it. Uh, a York, I would have been surging a long time ago. Not a, not a knock on York, it's just different design. They have, they have kind of a different approach to theirs. So that York, and for those same design parameters, I'm probably not going to get that thing to run much above 85. So, uh, yeah, that's 85 entering water, not leaving, entering water. So uh, that would be that would be kind of something I would expect, you know, something something along those lines. You know, but again, if you're running, you know, an ice bank or something along those lines, you know, you're running much lower evaporators. Granted, those those centrifugals are designed for. Uh, those compressors are designed for to run at that low of a uh, of a chill water, which means they have a higher lift capacity, and they're they're built that way versus one that's is also more expensive because of that versus one that was designed for um, you know just regular forty five. Uh, Basically, water cooling tower only, no dry. <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, no. All right. Uh, I could go into, I mean, we're right there at time. Uh, it's not that I've covered everything but uh, I'll tell you what I could go into approach I've talked about approach a bunch between I think I even brought it up yesterday uh, and, and talked about it a little bit and laminar flow and things so I'm actually going to skip over that for now and I'm going to go straight to recovery charging and vacuum that's something that uh, a lot of y'all ask a lot of questions about not you know most of you haven't experienced it so, um, with a with a water cooled system, typically, what's what's really important because you're dealing with flooded based barrels at this point. Um, you uh, you've got to make sure that the water in those barrels is flowing, especially on the evaporator side. Because remember from yesterday. The condenser, unless it has a subcooler circuit, most of the time the condenser may not have liquid refrigerant standing high enough to touch the tubes, but the evaporator absolutely will. So what can happen is if you don't flow water and as you're doing your recovery, 
you know, instead of flowing water, you could drain the water. That is an alternative. Some people do it that way. I personally don't. If I have the option in a pump, I'm going to flow water through the, through the barrel. Sometimes that's not an option, legitimately. So if that's not an option, get that water out of that barrel. Don't let any water stand in there on both of them. Just play it safe. Do the evaporator and the condenser. Just precautions. Anyway, if you don't do that, whenever you're doing the recovery and you start to uh, pull the system down and pressure, which is causing, you know, it's causing your saturation to drop and you'll get down below freezing in saturation and still have a significant amount of liquid refrigerant and you can um, uh, damage, expand, rupture the, the tubes in there and create a world of a mess for yourself. I mean, if you, if you, want, a, you want a good experience of, a, of a, something you never want to do again, try that. Uh, so yeah, you don't want to freeze the tubes. Um, if, if one experience that I could say I can never wish on anybody is checking the refrigerant side of your chiller to find that you have a bunch of water shooting out at you. I've actually got a video. If you ever want to see that, uh, I've got a video where that happened. It was actually, uh, two years ago now. The freeze, freeze to push through. And in that freeze, I was looking at an air cooled uh, carrier. And that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, the, now, the recovery didn't freeze the tubes, the freeze did. And the electric the power failed to the building. So it froze for different reasons, but the results are the same. The refrigerant flooded the chill water loop. Uh, and overpressurized it, caused all kinds of water leaks and damage because of the loop pressurizing so high. But at the same time, uh, it literally filled the chiller with water, like filled with water. Uh, the craziest thing I ever I saw, just you, you pushed in on the liquid line and you just had water shoot, shoot out at you from the Schrader. It's, it's bad. Anyway, flow water, flow water. That applies to recovery or charging. Doesn't matter. Because in the same way, when you're charging the refrigerant back in, if as you're charging it, you know, and everything's boiling off and, and is trying to fill back up, you're still going to be below freezing on your saturation um, until you get enough refrigerant in there to build enough pressure to come out of a freezing condition. And that's when it's really dangerous. And if you've got a, if you've got a DX barrel, meaning the refrigerant's inside the tubes, it's not, in my opinion, some people disagree with me, it's not as big of a deal. Because if the water freezes, it's freezing on the outside of the tube and it's got plenty of room to expand. Uh, and not that much refrigerant sits in those tubes to begin with. I mean, you get you have refrigerant in there, but it's it's not it's not like you're having a flooded barrel where literally the entire barrel is full of liquid refrigerant, and you've got a small amount of water in tiny little tubes, which isn't that hard to freeze. Anyway, um, so the recovery port is going to be on the bottom of the chiller. If you walk up to a water cooled chiller. Uh, you'll see coming out the bottom of the evaporator that there is a, um, I mean, it could be five eighths, could be half inch. It will be somewhere along those lines. I think most of them are half inch, but anyway, five eighths, half inch, whatever the size is, you'll have a uh, big port coming out. A lot of times it may even just literally be a ball valve. Now it's a not a, just a regular go buy from Home Depot ball valve, but it'll be a ball valve that you can open and close uh, to recover that refrigerant, you know, and, and you can hook up whatever machine you like to that, you know, just adapt it down however you do it. Um, so that's, that's, and you do the same method with charging and even pulling a vacuum. So that, that main line coming out that is your primary port for recovery for charge and for vacuum that's what i'll hook everything up to 
and your vacuum gauge or your micron gauge would go up. I, I personally prefer it on the top of the evaporator. That's usually where I'll put it. You can put it on the condenser if you want. It's technically further away. Um, but uh, you, uh, yeah, that's that would be the proper procedure. So what's really critical whenever you're doing, especially if you have a low pressure. Uh, so if you've got a low pressure recovery, a lot of the times as you pull that system down, you're going to pull that thing. I mean, it's already in a vacuum because it's low pressure, but you're going to essentially, you're going to hook up a micron gauge a lot of times to that low pressure machine. And you're going to, you're going to pull until you start pulling down into that micron gauge. And it's a lot of people's practice that they'll pull a low pressure recovery down to, you know, thousand microns, 500 microns. Uh, I've, I've, I've worked, so there's companies, uh, there's a company local to us. Honestly, they're, they're a great company. I don't mind, uh, uh shouting them out. It's a uh, rapid recovery, do really good work, but that's how they train their guys. They train their guys when they're doing low pressure recoveries, they want them to recover that machine down to somewhere between a thousand to 500 microns. And when they hit that point, then, you know, that's, that's, uh, barring cer special circumstances, that's when they say their recovery is finished and they've got a literal micron gauge hooked up to it. Now, a high pressure machine obviously is not going to be exactly the same. Uh, you still need to make sure you pull that down really, really well. But, uh, yeah. Um, uh, it, I mean, some of them may spec at that. I don't know. But hey, like I said, that, 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 that's also where uh, personal preferences and all that starts to play into, into the matter and different, different experiences. And that, is, that is a good comments question. You know, those who have some experience in this, when you do a low pressure recovery, how far do you pull it down? Where, what's your cutoff point? Is it 25 inches? Is it down into the microns? Uh, what's, your, what's your training and preference tell you to do? Um, Something like that. Like inches or 30, see, I think train says a barrel and freeze and bust in under a minute when refrigerant migrates, which is essentially what's happening during charge and recovery. If you push pull all your liquid and get it all out before you switch to vapor, there's no chance of freezing. Uh, yeah. No? Okay. All right. Yeah. If, you, if you're using push-pull, I, I get where you're coming from. You're going to basically maintain the same pressure, but you're sucking all the liquid out of the system. So, yeah, absolutely. Push-pull is, um, push is a solid recovery method. Absolutely. It's not my personal uh, choice. Uh I, I, I'm, a, I'm in favor of uh, the subcooler method. And in using the subcooler method, uh, it's somewhat conventional, but not, not exactly. So when I say subcooler method, uh, what I'll do is, hell, I'll draw it. Uh, we'll come over here. Do, 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 do. I've got mixed feelings on push-pull. Again, totally legitimate. Lots of use cases. I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm okay with it. But I've got, I've got my... Oh, I've got the wrong marker. Throw that one away. All right, so here's my tank. I'm coming into the liquid port. Out the vapor port into my machine and then I'm coming back out of my machine going through uh, my subcooler and then back out of my subcooler after I've condensed my vapor into another tank. Now it is, I've done it both ways um, 
I find both completely comparable. What I like about this method is I don't have to do a, ch a vapor changeover. Everything's done out the gate. And I do, because of the subcooler, the subcooler is the critical key here. If the subcooler wasn't there, this would be a waste of time. Don't do this. But if you've got a quality subcooler, my opinion, I this is how I do a low pressure or, or a water cooled recovery or just about any recovery. Uh, sometimes I don't have the liquid collection tank. You know, if, if it's a smaller poundage, you know, if it's only a couple hundred pounds, I may not do that. But when you're, when you're talking hundreds into thousands of pounds of refrigerant, this is what I'll do. And so you might fill four of these tanks with liquid before uh, your vapor tank ever fills up enough. And I've done, uh, heck, I've done thousands, 1,200 pound recoveries and have the same vapor tank the whole time. Everything collects in a liquid tank and you really don't have that much vapor coming back off of it. Because essentially what you're doing is you're pulling, the recovery machine's pulling this tank into a slight vacuum, which is sucking the liquid in and then that's coming into the bottom and then we're pulling the vapor off the top, keeping it at a slightly lesser pressure than the chiller. And then we're taking that little bit of vapor, recondensing it down through the subcooler and then just dropping it into the tank. And for me, like I said, it just, it removes steps for me, personal preference. Nothing wrong with uh, push-pull at all, really not. 30 inches, yeah, we got two guys say they, they use uh, 30 inches, so that's the same, yeah, same, same. Uh, chillers use regular water, or do they use something else? Uh, chillers will, it depends on your situation. All of mine, all of mine, minus one, use, yeah, just regular water. Um, but we don't freeze the way, and, and we don't have the low ambient temperatures that they have up north. You know, we're down here in central Texas, not really that big of a problem. So minus a random freeze where we lose all power for a week. You factor that out of the equation and we're perfectly fine. Anyway, uh, in, in northern states, those systems are specifically designed with glycol-based systems, so they'll be diluted to whatever. Or in an industrial application where you're trying to run a freeze bank, right? So, or an ice bank, you you would have a glycol-based solution at that point because your water, regular water, would freeze. But when you dilute it with glycol, there'd be a 15 percent or 30 percent, whatever it is. Uh, you can get the freezing temperature down to what? I mean, close to zero in some 30, cases. 35%, I believe, gets you at a minus eight. There's freeze point and then burst point is, is even lower than that. There you go. So, yeah. Uh, 35 when a centrifugal, use push pull from the bottom of the evaporator to use a slope tank. Slop, slop tank. Uh, when you switch over to vapor and walk away, next day it's done. You don't even need to run pumps or drain water. Uh, what's the recovery time with that method? Um, doing this, I can, I can do a thousand pounds in what? somewhere between six to eight hours on a, on a low pressure. Yeah, I can do a low pressure recovery, thousand pounds, give or take, in between six to eight hours with, without, without any major hiccups. Um, so yeah, so push pull, you say you can get 80% in two hours, 1200 pounds. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You're still having to deal with vapor. That's that's the thing is you're you're dealing with vapor recovery still. You know, it's it's you still have a lot of vapor to deal with. Uh, Jay, what is exactly the best method? I think we're gonna wrap it up, guys. It's after seven thirty. Uh, 
Uh, ever recover liquid while running the compressor? Um, yes, on small systems. Uh, we'll, we'll use compressor assisted recovery is, is the uh, term I use for it at least. Um, anyway, it, it is something we do on a smaller system. It is not something I would personally want to do on like say a centrifugal. Um, yes, yeah, so I wouldn't, I don't, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't practice that, but y'all got y'all's, y'all's own thing figured out over there. So, uh, I'm not going to say y'all, you shouldn't do it. I mean, anyway. All right. Appreciate it guys. That was a good one. Uh, we're going to talk as you know, the training committee, we're going to get together and chat things out. But something we are considering is over the next few months, maybe till the end of the year, uh, selecting specific uh, series of equipment. So, for example, next month doing a deep dive into a CVH, uh, uh, yeah, just a CVH series machine. And so at that point, talk about just all the all the specific parameters and everything I've been talking about here that we're trying to fit everything across the board, right? So taking everything you've just learned, now actually applying that to a very specific design and, and tailoring that to that. So we're thinking about that. We may not go that route. We'll see what we do. Uh, we probably have our committee meeting next week or the week after and go from there, make those decisions. But hope you enjoyed it. Everybody on YouTube, hope, uh, hope you all enjoyed it as well. Um, just for clarification, you know, I work for air performance in central Texas. These classes are tailored to our technicians. Um, but just so happens that through lots of troubleshooting, we found that YouTube happened to be a fairly easy and convenient way compared to some of the other ways we've tried to do it in the past. So we've now opened this up and kind of expanded it to y'all's benefit. So hope y'all enjoy it. And uh, if anybody is ever interested, we are hiring. So you can go to AP, uh, APSCentralTX.com forward slash join us, join our team, join something. It's worth it. Uh, yeah, listen over here, Mr. Uh, Jason Johnson. Uh, he's, uh, yeah, we came from Buffalo, New York. Yep. It's been, it's been a fun ride. I love it here. So appreciate it, guys. See everybody later. MTT. There you go. MTT. Can't forget that. Let's see if I can actually close this thing out today. Yesterday it gave me trouble. I know. It was, you were just like, I'm going to close it out.